Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Foundry Church YouTube channel. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you guys do that right now. That way you can stay up to date with all the content that we show through this channel. And also we have an Apple podcast as well. So if you wanna hear the audio version of what you're about to see here, make sure you go and check that out today too. If you wanna know more that's happening kind of during the week here at the Foundry Church, we post a lot of things on Facebook. So make sure you like us on Facebook as well. With that being said, let's continue our series. Listen. Well, Foundry Church, diving into week three, we are going to be looking into um, imagery tonight. We're using the, um, the prophet Ezekiel. He spoke and declared the word of the Lord in the land of Israel, and he was a faithful prophet of God. Um, he's one of the major prophets, so you have the majors, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Then you have the minor prophets, and they're a little bit smaller books, and, and they go on towards uh, the end of the Old Testament and um, Ezekiel talks to us with vivid imagery. God shows him some things, and he finds himself um, kind of coming alive. He's declaring the word of the Lord. Have you ever come alive? Like, um, I'm a prank person. I love pranks. I love when someone's sitting at their desk and their eye kind of does that thing. You're like, oh, they're sleepy. Oh, I'm just going to wait till they nod a little, and they're like, hey! and they freak out. They kind of come alive. It's like, you you know, you hit them with a cattle prod, which we don't do, but I'm willing if the option arises. Um, so it's one of those things where you come alive, right? You, you may be, um, I, one of my favorite pranks is getting behind a tow truck that's towing a semi backwards with a person sleeping next to you, and you're just driving, you're like, ah! and they wake up, and they're like, ah! <laughs> and they start crying, and you're like, and that was awesome. And then they hit you a lot, and you're like, dude, I'm driving. It's not safe. It's great. I love that kind of stuff. Come alive. Because all of a sudden, like, I'll never be able to sleep again. They're really alive, right? They're fully awake. They're fully engaged. In the prophet Ezekiel's life, he was calling for the children of Israel to come alive. He was calling for them to come alive. He was naming some things that were going on, and God was speaking a matter on God's heart through Ezekiel, calling the people back to himself and saying, look, no matter the state you're in, I'm a God who can resurrect. So join me as we listen in. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Speaking of heavenly things, 
When prophets declare the word of the Lord, they're speaking of heavenly things. They're detailing to the people of God things that are close to the heart of God. And we, we don't have to wonder if God spoke to the prophets or through them. He did. He did. He very much did. And here's the thing. There is accounts in Scripture of God speaking to people and telling them how he's going to talk. Right? It's it's kind of like um, anybody ever ever watched the show um, Phineas and Ferb? Anybody? If you have a such, I mean that show is just on fire genius. It's great. And uh, Doofenshmirtz, evil Doctor Doofenshmirtz, um, he always lays out his plan to parry the platypus. Which I know there's a part of you that's just dying inside that I'm using this, but he always laid out his plan. You know, this is what I'm going to do, Patty. And then, and then the little platypus would defeat him because he knew the plan. Right? This is what God's doing. He's detailing some things that are actually going to happen. He's telling them what's going to go on. This is how I'm going to speak in Numbers chapter. 12, Aaron and Miriam. So Miriam would have been the little girl who followed the wicker basket holding the infant Moses in the Nile River. That's Miriam. Aaron, his older brother, the the first high priest of the people of Israel, Aaron and Miriam are summoned to the tent of meeting in Numbers chapter 12, and God decided to let them know something. Check this out. Now, I don't know about you, but I have got a guilty complex, and when anybody of any authority summons me to meet with them, I just implode. I'm like, oh, they know who I am, right? I just kind of fall apart. Like me as a child getting called to the principal's office, I literally would clean, clean out my desk. I was like, you were great people. It was good knowing you. This is the end, right? So they get summoned to the tent of meeting to talk with God. God summons them, and this is what he says. The Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and he stood at the entrance to the tent and he summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. So God's going to give some imagery to someone and some visual to someone to uh, help them communicate what's on his heart. Here's one cool thing. Right after this verse, it says, but Moses, my servant, to him I speak face to face. Probably shouldn't question Moses. This is a pretty awesome chapter of the Bible. So we do know that God speaks in visions and dreams. There's other dreamers in Scripture, right? Joseph. Joseph. He's, he saw dreams. He dreamed dreams. He interpreted dreams. We also know Jacob. He had visions, right? Jacob's ladder at the River Jabuk. He was, he, the angels going up and down. So we know that there were other dreamers. There was um, Daniel, the prophet Daniel. We'll talk about him next week. There was Joseph, the husband of Mary. And the angel visited him in a dream and spoke to him. So we know that God speaks, and there's dreamers in the Bible who are interpreting the word of God. Heavenly things that are hard for us to understand. There was a very learned man in Israel, I think in John chapter 3, whose name was Nicodemus, and um, Jesus is having this conversation with it. And we're going to approach it just a little bit backwards. Let's talk about what Jesus says to him. He says to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus says, how can this be? And Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And you don't understand these things very truly. I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen. But still, you people don't accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe heavenly things? It's hard for us to get our mind around the imagery and the reality of what's going on when God reveals something to us, even right in front of us, and we can't quite put our mind around it. Maybe there's imagery that's really complex. Maybe it's a lot like that um, Ezekiel 37. There's hearts of stone rattling bones and rebirth. And you think like, okay, wait a minute. What, what's God using all this for? What are these metaphors intended to communicate? I want you to imagine with me President George Washington all august in his blue colonial uniform, right? The first president who refused to be king. He would not restart a monarchy, and he would, um, would, you know, like serve as president, and then he would step away. Just an amazing man, 
an amazing man. I want you to imagine taking President George Washington to IMAX and watch Star Wars. And he'd be like, how can this be that that Yeti flies a spaceship in the great beyond? Right? He would be completely, it, the visions, the imagery would not make sense. When they go to hyperspace, he'd be like, have they vanished? Like, I, I just, I can imagine him just being like, now this is a great man, but the imagery would be too much. The concept would be too much. And just communicating to him, like, he would be like a kid in a 3D theater, like, trying to get a hold of the image, right? He would be like, are they real? And apparently he's a southern gentleman in my mind. But, um, but can't you just see him like, like you know, i got to tell Martha about this. This is amazing, you know, and, and all excited. There's a falcon and a millennium, and it's going to be great. And he's, how would he, now, that's a big deal for him to understand. Now, send him back. Send him back to Valley Forge and say, tell them about it. Can you imagine him sitting down with Benjamin Franklin? Put on your special glasses. George has a story. Right? He would, they would be like, what are you, he lost his mind. He lost his mind. What are you talking about? It's a very real thing in our present day, but it's out in the future, and he can't understand it or put his mind around it. How's he going to communicate it? I think the prophets face a lot of these same challenges. Because they're given a vision that is beyond their comprehension. They're given a word that they have to communicate back to the people of God. And it's not just some ethereal Star Wars world. He's, he's telling them, this is what is the matter on my heart. This is what I'm passionate about for you as my created people. I love you. I'm pursuing you. In Ezekiel 36 we see some neat imagery emerge about the ministry God intends to do in the, in the humanity he created. In all of us who bear his image and his likeness, he says this, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all countries, bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This is before the era of heart transplant. People had to be like, what? Right? Like, how? what? How's that going to happen? How's that going to work? And then he goes on to say, I will remove from you your heart of stone. What? They, they have to be thinking like, we have stones? Like, imagine with me the, the link they had to go to get their mind around this word. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you, the spirit of God that dwells in the temple. I will actually put it into your bodies and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That is an image that's hard to understand. And they can't quite get their heads around it. So let's just go back to the valley that we heard the story about. Let's go back there. I don't know if you've ever gone out maybe hunting and you've come upon a carcass that is long since deceased and it's nothing but dry bones. You're like, I wonder what that was, you know? You know, kind of kick it and falls apart. It's a little weird. But there are places, physical places on this earth where there are, val- or there are fields of bones and they're human bones. If you go outside of Stalingrad, it, one of the good things, if you ever listen to a, a podcast, Dan Carlin, Hardcore History, uh, Ghosts of the Ostfront. It was so good. And he talks about going out into this field and seeing a field white with bones. And they're like, this is the German Army Group Center. They broke on Stalingrad in the, in the Moscow winter. This is the bones of the German sh- soldiers. And it's, it's a valley like or a field white with bones. Like, so you can imagine this is a real thing. Imagine being taken there. It says Ezekiel was in the spirit and God took him there and showed him a valley of dry bones. Bleached and dried out. There is no life left in him. You're not like, how can we save him, doctor? Well, we're past that. We should probably respectfully bury them, right? But God's not saying that's how it is. God's going to give them new imagery. And he says to him, prophesy to these bones. Speak to these bones that no longer have ears. Speak to these bones. That which is dead, I will call to life. Speak out to them, Ezekiel. Tell them my plans. Prophesy to them. And then as he does, he hears a rattling. 
what are you going to do when that happens? Like if a valley of bones starts rattling, I'm like, I'm out. And it's creepy. I'm upset with it. And I don't like it. I don't like skeletons. I'm not big on that stuff, right? I would freak out. But he had to be like, they're moving. And all of a sudden, they start getting their tendons, right? They're getting their tendons. And there's, there's muscle coming around them. That he's seeing this vision of the, of the bodies really being re-embodied. And then he says, prophesy. Prophesy to the breath, the pneuma, the ruach, that, that prophesy, the spirit of God breathing into them. Prophesy that the spirit of God would move in them and awaken them. And he does this, and he speaks to them, and they become the army of God, right? Not some weird, horrible zombie army, but a fully restored, brought back to life, health in your bones body. And God's saying something in this. He's saying, that which you think is lost and not ever redeemable, I don't agree. I can fix what is unfixable. I, I can repair what is long beyond repair. I am God. We have to understand imagery. We have to understand the imagery God is giving in these stories. Because remember how we talked about Nicodemus, where Jesus is like, you're a teacher of Israel. How do you not get this? Here's the reason Jesus said this to him. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to be born again, to which Nicodemus was horrified at that thought. He clearly was a literalist. So he goes to Jesus in, the, in secret, and he says, so am I supposed to go like back in the womb? My mom's super going to hate that, by the way. So can we get a different answer, please, Rabbi, right? And Jesus has compassion on him because he can't even grasp the imagery of being born again, being born in the spirit, being born in a brand new way, baptized into the death of Christ so that he can be raised into new life in Christ. He doesn't understand this language yet. It's a prophetic tremor in his life, and he's going, I don't understand the imagery. It's too big for me. I don't get it. How do you get reborn? Is it literal? And you can see that it's hard for people to understand imagery, even when they know the Old Testament and sometimes even the New Testament, front to back. It's hard to understand it. So if you hear these stories of rattling bones and God waking up that which was long dead and using it for his purposes, and um, you see God creating a new heart, a new body, a new life, a rebirth, and it does something inside of you, and it resonates within you. Something is said or done that resonates with you. I don't know about you, but it, there's certain people when they talk, they resonate with me. And I can't help but tune my ear to them. I don't know if it's the cadence of their talking, the content, but I love there's certain people when they talk, I listen. And it's one of the very few times I shut down and just listen. But there are people that resonate. If this message resonates with me, with you, and you just want to hear more about new hearts, old long dead things coming to life and rebirth, and you're going, I don't understand it. Why is this resonating with me? It's because of this. It is the matter that is closest to the heart of God, that those who are far from God come home and receive not religious activity, but a new heart, that their old broken down life would be reformed and remade into the image of Jesus Christ, that they would experience in some measure a rebirth that goes beyond physical capacity to describe it. I don't know, I'm just brand new. How many times have you heard a Christian, a new Christian say that? And if you've never heard it, go evangelize to somebody and then come tell me the answer. It's the greatest thing ever. When you see a person who is pretty profoundly broken and sinful and they're like, I just feel brand new. I just want to live for Jesus and I don't know how. He's all I can talk about, but I don't have anything good to say other than he saved me. The reason it resonates is because you're in tune with the Spirit of God saying this is what matters most to our Heavenly Father. This is what matters most, the new heart, the new life, and the rebirth. So that's why it still speaks, because it's the Word of God. It's the story of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. It's the story of the hope we live in as Christians, knowing that Jesus died for our sins. But sometimes, especially in these um, older, you know, books of the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, we get a lot of, well, the imagery can be a little troubling. It can be a little much. It seems confusing. 
And so we just avoid it. Help me out today. Please, I'm begging you, help me out. Raise your hand if you ever avoid the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation because it's just a little weird. Oh, good. It's so good. My hand's up for a reason. I really struggle sometimes. I'm like, what does that horn mean? And why is that coming out of the beast? You know, like you, you read these things, you're like, what is going on? It seems like it's a little much. But whether I like them or really study them or I avoid them doesn't change the fact that just because I'm intimidated by it, it doesn't mean I don't need to dig in and trust that God's still speaking. It's still his word, and I need to read and study it, even though I may not fully grasp everything in it. It doesn't mean it's not true. God's word never returns void. He will accomplish what is the matter on his heart in his life and your life paired together. His desire is to work together with you in this. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says this to John, the revelator. He says, blessed are those who read aloud the word read aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who take to heart what is written in it. So here's what we know about prophecy. Here's a few things we just know about imagery and prophecy. First of all, the Lord will achieve his purposes whether or not we believe in it. We can have confidence that the word of God will not return void, but he will accomplish his purposes and his plans whether or not we believe. Anybody here ever see the movie Elf? All your hands should go up, right? All right, join me. End of the movie, right? Very end of the movie. Santa's going through the park with Buddy the Elf. This isn't in scripture, by the way. This is a movie, right? And Zoe Deschanel gets up there. And in her weird little back of the throat nasal voice, you better watch out. You better not cry. And she starts singing much better than that. I think I might be 13 by that tryout. Um, a little crack in the voice, but she's like, better not pout, I'm telling you why. And then a few other people in the crowd start singing. And Santa's belief o meter starts going up because people believe so Santa's power is getting stronger and eventually the curmudgeon old publisher is like Santa Claus is coming to town and the belief o meter hits 100 and off the sleigh goes no jet propulsion needed because there was enough belief to get it in the sky that is not Christianity whether we believe it or not it is true Your belief doesn't change truth. Your feelings don't change truth. You may not like it. If a cop hands you a ticket and you're like, I don't like this, well, you need to either pay it or plan to be in court on this date. Because the truth is you have a ticket in your hand, whether you like it or not. The truth is with Christianity, what God said he does, he will do. It is not up for debate. God will raise the dried out dead bones, and create new life. He will create new life. He will give us a new heart. He will give us a rebirth. He is truth. So let me just say this for us as a church. I want you to hear me. When you hear the term, or anyone ever say, like if you share your faith and they're like, that's good, that's your truth. I have my truth. Oh my word. I have a lot of words I can't use in church about that line. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Truth is not subjective. It is or it isn't. And this is the reality we face. People are like, well, that's your truth. No, it is truth. God is truth. He is declaring something. He is the great I am. When Moses said, who shall I tell Pharaoh sent me? God said, tell him I am that I am. Whether you believe it or not, I am. Whether you want it or not, I am. Every breath you take is a confession of my name. I am, is what God said. Go tell them that's who sent you. His being will make matters complete. But how wonderful is it to think about and to realize that God wanted to complete matters with you. He wanted you to be a part of what he's doing. He didn't want it to be some like far off thing that only other people do. I'm gonna have a priesthood with no other people taking part. No way, the priesthood of all believers Get involved. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and it can't be upended or destroyed because it's the purposes and plans of God according to his will, not yours. Take part with him in it. How good is that? Another truth we see is that prophecy shows the mercy and the love of God. It actually shows the mercy and love of God. 
It's God's effort to communicate to his people that they need to return to him, that they need to trust him, that they need to follow him. Yes, prophecy can be feared, full of some weird and strange imagery, but down at the bottom, the matter of God's heart is at hand. And what he's saying is an invitation always to come back. He may be warning. He may be using scary image, he, images. He may be doing things that um, cause some alarm because of the pictures he paints. It may even be scary, but it's not because God's mean. He's not up there with the smite button. Oh, they don't see it coming. Katang. Oh, oh, man. Cinder and ashes. That's not how he works. That's not how God intends to, to treat things. He doesn't do things for no reason. He's The reason God speaks prophetically is an effort of mercy and love to create relationship for us. The warning is out of love. All right, let's go to a fictitious playground in our brain real quick, okay? I want you to imagine a nice green field, and at the edge of the field, a 2,000-foot sheer cliff, right? Lovely, okay? So I'm thinking Ireland. This feels very Irish to me, Phil. All right, so, um, sorry, it's more like herdsman thing. All right, so we've got a green field, and you're out with some friends, and you're playing football, Right? And let's just say I'm playing football, Erica's the quarterback, my wife, and she just lets one fly. And I'm running full speed because you've never seen jets quite like this egg-shaped, I can move. And so I'm running, and I see the ball, and I've locked in. You know, and in my head I can just hear it, Odell, right? I'm going to jump up and grab the ball. But all I hear is the shrieking sound of my wife going, stop, stop. And I'm thinking, why would I stop? My greatest moment is at hand. I'm about to Odell this ball, and everybody's going to see that, yes, middle-aged, but still fantastic, right? No, she would be screaming, stop, not because she doesn't want me to have a great moment. She doesn't want me to have that be my last moment before I enter eternity. If I was headed for the cliff at full speed, focused on the wrong thing, what would she yell? Stop. If you're running through life, headed for hell, what do you think God's going to do? Stop. And sometimes there's scary images, but it's not because he's ticked. He wants your attention. He's screaming, but we're just focused on the moment we're about to have and the glory that will follow, you know? It's like, oh, church, when we see prophecy and weird imagery, there's nothing apart. There's nothing apart from it than this. God's desire to show love and mercy to the people he is redeeming, has redeemed or is redeeming. He wants to protect you from your own base instincts, from your own desires that always kind of lead us astray. It is because in all the imagery we see, there's one underlying truth. God loves you, and he's speaking loudly to preserve you and call you back to himself. We at the Foundry Church have these things called plumb lines. We operate by our um, values at the Foundry Church. We have our values, and that guards us in how we do ministry and life together. But our plumb lines are like the lanes... uh, You know, picture uh, I-96 here. We know which way is the east and west, right? But um, the plumb lines are like the lanes, and it tells you how to drive the rules of the road. We do ministry more effectively and uh, more clearly when we know our plumb lines. We stay in line, and we do things a certain way. Here's an example of it. If you're in groups, you have probably already heard a little bit about this. But on the creative team, we have this thing, clarity over creativity, right? We don't want to do something that's a really legit creative idea, but suddenly everybody gets confused about what we're supposed to talk about. Maybe the gospel gets muddied because we had a cool creative thing. So we'll always get rid of the creative idea that makes things cloudy and we'll value clarity more. Another one is plan and pencil because life happens And in ministry, you have to plan in pencil. You have good plans laid out, but you're always willing to adjust and be flexible because just in the end, I mean, ministry's gonna ebb and flow. You have to plan in pencil. All right, those are plumb lines we have. And the plumb lines are really important for us as a church and as leadership. As we begin to study prophecy in this church, we have a plumb line for prophecy that I think will bless you. It has blessed me and has really helped in the study and work on this uh, series because when I 
when I'm going to tell a little bit about the Ezekiel 37, Valley of Dry Bones, I'm not going to pull up short. I want to go into it and all the things it means. And it, I will not forget when uh, Erica and I were talking, and she's just like, that's not, remember, stay on focus. We're not talking about the interpretive thing. We're talking about imagery and what God's saying. And I'm like, oh, but I want to go into the cool stuff. And she said this, message over mystery. Stick to the message. Don't get caught up in the hype of the mystery. Look at the heart of the matter and don't fixate on imagery or what it could mean because it's tempting to do so. I want to tell you about a prophetic word I was given when we started the foundry. We started it, started out pretty good, a little over 100 people. I applied all my wisdom and education and passion and I grew it down to 21 and it was pretty rough. And, um, and things were bad, and I had, I had gotten pretty arrogant, if I'm honest, and God was doing a work in me. Oh, man, it hurt so bad. And I will never forget, a friend of mine, Kurt, called me, and he said, hey, um, I had a dream, and i got to share it with you. I'm like, oh, awesome. And he said, there was a raging storm, a raging storm, just water going everywhere, a raging, raging storm. But through the storm was this small little tunnel, and you were walking through it, and the storm didn't touch you. It was like there was a path of peace through the raging storm. It didn't mean the storm wasn't real. It just meant if you stayed in this place and you were obedient, to, or if you stayed in this place, then that's where you were safe. And I was like, there's a storm? Right? At first I was like, man, and I'm like, of course there's a storm. This has been brutal. And so I was thinking about it, and here's what really stuck with me. So what was the vision? It was a raging storm, a, like an ocean, a kind of a wild, ferocious thing. And then this, this tube, this tunnel, kind of like I think of like SeaWorld with a little shark encounter where you go through the tube, like that kind of thing. And, um, and I, could, I could go through that. And I was like, okay, and here's what I came away with. God knows about the storm, and God will protect me if I, if I obey. If I obey, God will protect me. If I go off my way, it's not going to be pretty. I'm going to be in the storm. But if I stay with God, the storm will rage around me, but he'll protect me. And I literally, it was, a, it was a moment by moment for a number of months for me, just obedience after obedience. And that word helped me stay the line. It helped me stay the course that God had set. Here's what I didn't do. I didn't ask Kurt, was the water cold? What would cold water mean? Was it in Michigan? Was it blue or briny green like the Pacific? Can you give me a deeper word? I didn't do that, though I wanted to. I didn't ask him. You know, like, uh, were there sharks? Because if there's sharks, I don't want to be eaten. Did you see any sharks? Did they have name tags? Like, you know, I, I could have I could have asked more and more questions, but in the end, I honed in on the message, not the mystery. I realized that God had spoken prophetically into my life, and here's what I want to share with you. God will speak prophetically into your life if you will listen. God will speak and lean into you, and he will make a way. But I will tell you this, it was the most unlikely path I've ever traveled. It was so crazy, but the reality of it is I would have never been as patient, obedient, and fearfully in awe of God as I was in that season had my friend not said, dude, I had a weird dream and you were in it. And he called me up and he shared it. And it formed and continues to reform my life. Don't ever get confused and go for the mystery. Always pick the message over the mystery. God will make clear, usually hindsight, we look back and see God at work. God will make clear his plans and his purposes to us. But he usually does it one obedient step at a time. Pray with me. God, we thank you and love you for your word and the way it speaks into our lives. And I ask God that as we attend to it, that your spirit would move on us. You would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and use all that we say and all that we do for his glory and his glory alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope that you found today's teaching to be uplifting and encouraging, but also very challenging for you and your spiritual walk with Christ. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's teaching, make sure that you click the link below because that'll take you to our weekly devotions. And devotions are a vital part of what we do here at the Foundry Church. So be sure to do that. Thanks again for joining us and we cannot wait to see you again next week.